This is a short, short question. It is being asked since the last three years. It's been asked in all the exams and no one should make a mistake in this. A 45 year old male with a history of NSAID consumption comes to the emergency with severe abdominal pain. He has tachycardia and hypotension and rebound tenderness. Now we know rebound tenderness is a feature of peritonitis, right? And why is there peritonitis? Because in the x-ray you can see gas under diaphragm. So this is an x-ray of gas under diaphragm. This nobody should make a mistake in. Every one should be able to diagnose this. When there is gas under diaphragm, we have to give IV fluids and take up the patient for an immediate leprotomy. Leprotomy means we have to open up the abdomen and explore. A baby is playing unsupervised, complains of difficulty in swallowing since the last few hours. X-ray is done and a foreign body is seen. So how do we differentiate whether this is in the trachea or it's in the esophagus? You can very clearly see in the lateral film, you can see this gas shadow. So we know that trachea is anterior, trachea is anterior and esophagus is posterior and you can see that the coin is behind the trachea right so it's in the esophagus any which ways even in the question they've said the patient has difficulty in swallowing so patient will have difficulty in swallowing only when there is a foreign body in the esophagus you should know that there are three constrictions at 15, 25 and 40. These values have also been asked and the narrowest portion is at 15 centimeters from the upper incisor. This is the pharyngeoesophageal junction or C6. The other two constrictions are when the arch of iota and when the esophagus pierces the diaphragm. The gold standard investigation for GERD is 24-hour pH monitoring. This everyone should be aware of, but there is a catch here. They are asking gold standard, so we will mask 24-hour pH monitoring. If they would have asked for gastroesophageal reflux disease, what is the investigation of choice? It is endoscopy. So the investigation of choice is endoscopy. The gold standard is 24-hour pH monitoring. This was another question which was asked in the recent FMG exam. You have to identify the pathology. They have shown an invertogram. It was written also, this is an invertogram. Invertogram is done when there is an imperforate anus. When there is an anorectal malformation, we turn the patient upside down. We keep a metallic pointer at the proposed site of the anal opening and then we take an X-ray. You can see that this is the gas shadow and this is the marker. If the distance is less than 2 cm, we call it as a low anorectal malformation. If the distance is more than 2 cm, we call it as a high anorectal malformation. Right? So this you should know, this was a new topic which was asked in the FMG exam last time. You should be aware of this. A chronic alcoholic patient with liver disease presents with melina and hematemesis. What is the most likely cause? So chronic alcoholic liver disease, it is most likely due to esophageal varices, right? Hematemesis and melina, it is due to esophageal varices. So variceal bleeding can give rise to this. Mallory V steer is also seen in alcoholic patients, but Mallory V steer is self-limiting. Right? It will start on the lower part of the esophagus and extends until the cardia, but it is usually self-limiting. A patient who underwent this surgery few months back complains of dizziness, headache and sweating 40 minutes after consumption of food. What is the most likely diagnosis? So the patient has ha undergone some kind of gastric surgery which you can see and a gastrojejunostomy has been done. When a gastrojejunostomy has been done, these patients can present with dumping. Now the symptoms are occurring after 40 minutes. So will it be early dumping or late dumping? This is going to be late dumping. Also you can see that the features are of hypoglycemia, dizziness, headache, sweating. So which again tells us that these are features of late dumping. Now early dumping occurs due to rapid influx of fluid inside the bowel. Patient will come with epigastric fullness, nausea and vomiting and these features would start within 10 to 15 minutes of consumption of food. And early dumping if the patient takes in more food, it will worsen. 
Late dumping, on the other hand, occurs due to rebound hypoglycemia, which is occurring because of excessive insulin release. So the features will be of hypoglycemia, like in the question stem, it will be improved by food and they will start 30 to 40 minutes after consumption of food. Now, how do we prevent dumping? That's another question which can be asked. So small frequent meals, avoid sugar rich liquid, avoid sugar rich liquids, avoid simple sugars and avoid liquids with meals. These are the ways how we can prevent dumping syndrome. What is the most common complication after bariatric surgery? It is iron deficiency. Vitamin B12 deficiency can also occur. Calcium or vitamin D3 deficiency can also occur. But the most common is iron deficiency. These three nutritional deficiencies you should be aware of. This was also asked in the previous exam. A patient is diagnosed with the pathology shown in the image. Which doctor should the patient be referred to? You can see that this is trichobezoar. Trichobezoar is when there is a hairball inside the stomach. And why is this hairball forming? Because the patient is eating his or her own hair. So this is a psychiatric problem of trichophagy, which is why the referral will go to a psychiatrist. This I've already told you, 25 year old female with dysphagia, barium is done. Gradual tapering, this is achalasia cardia, bird's beak appearance. Again, I am reiterating this question because this will definitely, definitely be asked. It's a free one mark which you should not lose out on. A patient comes to the ER with acute abdominal pain since one day. On examination, there is guarding present. Again, signs of peritonitis. You can see gas under diaphragm and this gas under diaphragm suggests that there is a hollow viscous perforation. Another name for this massive gas under diaphragm is football sign, which was asked in the recent NEAT exam. This is known as football sign as well, which was asked in the recent NEAT exam. After binge drinking, a young alcoholic male comes with hematemesis, which stops after some time. What is the diagnosis? So I showed you a previous question where they had given that the patient has chronic liver disease and hematemesis and melina. There the answer was varices. Here the patient is alcoholic, but it is self-limiting bleeding. I told you it stops after some time. So what was the other condition I told you? Mallory V tear. This is a Mallory V tear, which is a tear in the lower half of the esophagus, extends onto the cardia. The vessel which bleeds is the left gastric artery, but it is self-limiting. Okay. This question was asked last year in the FMG exam. Which of the following pairs of cancer staging have been marked correctly? Bladder cancer, WHO. Bladder cancer is going to be TNM staging. Testicular cancer is going to be again TNMS where S stands for the value of the tumor marker. Oral cancer, again we have the TNM staging. Gastric cancer, you can have the Borman staging and the Japanese classification. These are for gastric cancers. For early gastric cancer, you have the Japanese classification. For advanced gastric cancer, you have the Borman classification. You don't need to know the details of both of them. This question I've already told you, this is regarding nutcracker esophagus. Again, questions regarding appendicitis are frequently asked. I told you in the important topics, what is the site of maximum pain in acute appendicitis? We know it is the McBurney's point. The surface marking of McBurney's point has been asked many, many, many times in the exam. You should not go wrong in the marking of McBurney's point. McBurney's point is the site of maximum tenderness in appendicitis. And it is situated at the junction of lateral one-third and medial two-third. Again, lateral one-third, medial two-third along the line joining the anterior superior iliac spine with the umbilicus. Right? So that is where maximum tenderness is there. Soas sign can be seen. This is when we do hyperextension of the hip or flexion against resistance. And obturator sign can be seen when there is flexion and internal rotation which is done. That can give rise to pain. 
a female patient comes with a ra- with right hypochondrial pain radiating to the back with vomiting on examination there is guarding in the right hypochondrium she has had similar episodes in the last one year so right hypochondrial pain which structure is there in the right hypochondrium gall bladder that is correct so whenever there is pain in the when there is cholecystitis pain can be there in the right hypochondrium and guarding can be there so the answer is going to be acute cholecystitis don't get confused by pain radiating to the back right pain radiating to the back can happen in pancreatitis but pancreatitis pain will be in the epigastrium it will radiate to the back and it is relieved when the patient bends forward Another question which has been asked many times that the investigation of choice for cholecystitis and gallstones is ultrasound and on ultrasound you see a post acoustic shadow if there is a stone we will see a post acoustic shadow whereas if there is a polyp you will not see a post acoustic shadow no post acoustic shadowing will be seen here a 25 year old patient now comes with right iliac fossa pain vomiting and is managed conservatively she was stable when the pain worsened and the fever increased okay she required extra peritoneal drainage under ultrasound so what has happened here there is right iliac fossa pain we know in the right iliac fossa the appendix can be there because the patient is being managed conservatively this would have been a case of an appendicular lump when there is an appendicular lump that is when we will manage the patient conservatively right now when conservative management was being done either the patient this can resolve and we can discharge the patient or the condition can worsen like in this case and the patient can start running fever so that means an appendicular abscess was formed and that is what was drained using extra peritoneal drainage so this regime is called the oshner sherin regime where we manage appendicular lumps via the conservative means if the patient recovers we discharge the patient and we call the patient after 6 weeks for an interval appendectomy if the patient deteriorates we are dealing with an abscess and we need to drain it moving on A newborn child comes with a scaphoid abdomen and respiratory distress. X-ray shown, so you can see that all the bowel is inside the thorax. Why is the bowel inside the thorax? In a newborn child, the cause is congenital diaphragmatic hernia, and congenital diaphragmatic hernia again a very important topic which has been asked in the exam. two or three points which you should remember if you remember these two or three points you can answer questions regarding congenital diaphragmatic hernia the most common is bocdelic or left posterolateral and you can see this is also on the left side so this is most probably a bocdelic or left posterolateral hernia morgagni is right anteromedial you will get a scaphoid abdomen there's going to be respiratory distress and the most common cause of death in these patients is pulmonary hypoplasia the lung does not develop and that is what causes death we've already discussed this now we have a 35 year old patient who comes with sudden bout of chest pain after retching and vomiting so alcoholic patient sudden chest pain after retching and vomiting there is no hematemesis so this is not a mallory wee steer or varices right patient comes to the emergency there is tachycardia bp is all right auscultation there is decrease air entry on the left side and a crunching sound is heard on auscultating the heart this crunching sound is known as hammond sign and he is diagnosed with borhaf syndrome which is not a part of maclers triad so fever is not a part of maclers triad Maclar's triad is seen in spontaneous esophageal perforation or Boerhaave syndrome. Most common site is left posterolateral. Common in alcoholics, patient is going to come with Maclar's triad, which is retching, chest pain, and subcutaneous emphysema. And I told you, Hammond sign or crunching sound can be heard. This is diagnosed using a contrast study. 
This is Barrett's esophagus. This image has also been asked. You know, Barrett's esophagus is is a dysplasia or metaplasia? That is correct. This is metaplasia. This is metaplasia of squamous epithelium to columnar epithelium, and this is also known as specialized intestinal metaplasia. And if you do a biopsy of Barrett's, you are going to see goblet cells. That is the pathognomic thing which you will see. You are going to see goblet cells. This was asked in the exam. Killian's dehiscence is a potential space between thyropharyngeus and cricopharyngeus. And what comes out through the Killian's dehiscence? That's correct. Zenker's diverticulum can come out through Killian's dehiscence. It is a false diverticulum. It starts in the midline posteriorly, but final is left of the midline. The earliest feature is regurgitation, but the most common complication is aspiration pneumonitis. Another very important question, a 40-year-old female comes with progressive dysphagia to both solids and liquids. Now, there is dysphagia to both solids and liquids since last month. The body mass index is also low. There are no systemic illnesses. Barium swallow is shown. So, we can see there is gradual narrowing. So, what are we suspecting? Gradual tapering, dysphagia to both solids and liquids, achalasia, right? But it's a 40-year-old patient. Weight loss also is there. The differential is going to be carcinoma esophagus. So, which two investigations would you do to rule out both the conditions or to diagnose the condition? So, we need to do an we need to carry out upper GI endoscopy that will tell us about cancer and manometry that will tell us about the motility disorder. So for motility disorders, we do manometry and to rule out cancer, we are going to do an upper GI endoscopy. So investigations for esophageal disorders match the following. We have to do GERD. I told you investigation of choice is endoscopy, not 24 hour pH monitoring. Cancer is endoscopic biopsy. Hiatal hernia is CT with oral contrast. Zenker's diverticulum is barium swallow. And achalasia cardia motility disorders is manometry. So please remember, if you remember this table, you can easily answer questions regarding the investigations regarding esophageal disorders. A constant question which is definitely asked in the exam is hypertrophic pyloric stenosis, infantile hypertrophic pyloric stenosis. So we have a three week male child, three week male child. All these are very important. Usually manifests around third week. Male children are more frequently affected. First born male child. So the child has been diagnosed with idiopathic hypertrophic pyloric stenosis. They've asked the metabolic abnormality. This has been asked many, many times. It is hypochloremic, hypokalemic, metabolic alkalosis. So hypochloremic, hypokalemic, metabolic alkalosis. So males are more commonly affected. There is reduced levels of nitric oxide synthase in these patients. You can get string sign, double track sign or mushroom sign. These are some of the signs which can be seen on a contrast study. The metabolic abnormality, I've already told you. The fluid of choice has also been asked in the exam. So you should know it is N by 2 normal saline with dextrose and KCL. We start potassium when urine output is adequate. When do we start potassium? When urine output is adequate, then only we are going to start potassium replacement. Okay. So just to reiterate what we've discussed in the previous question, you have a five week male child, five week old male child brought to the emergency with multiple episodes of non bilious vomiting. Why non bilious? Because the obstruction is in the stomach and bile will come in the duodenum. So the obstruction is before that. So that's why it's non bilious. So this is mushroom sign which I just showed you. This is seen in hypertrophic pyloric stenosis. The investigation of choice for hypertrophic pyloric stenosis is ultrasound and the best time to examine the child is during feeding. A 45 year old female had total gastrectomy 6 or 7 years back and now has anemia and neurological symptoms. What type of anemia is most common in this patient? I told you following gastrectomy, I discussed one question earlier, 
you can have iron deficiency this is most common vitamin d3 deficiency and vitamin b12 deficiency so iron deficiency is the most common but here they are saying that there is neurological symptoms also so neurological symptoms means it is going to be megaloblastic anemia which is due to b12 deficiency then only the patient will have neurological symptoms had they asked most common overall you would have marked iron deficiency which of the following deficiencies is seen where terminal ileum is removed due to crohn's so it's going to be b12 deficiency because absorption of b12 will occur in the terminal ileum patient is taking broad spectrum antibiotics for a long time and the patient now comes with diarrhea what is the most likely organism so broad spectrum antibiotics it can alter the gut flora and the patient can develop clostridium difficile pseudomembranous enterocolitis or diarrhea and we can use oral vancomycin in these patients a male patient presents to the opd with an abdominal lump in the periumbilical region which moves at right angles to the attachment of the mesentery what is the most likely diagnosis so this question was asked two times two years back in both the fmg exams so this is a patient with a mesenteric cyst and the most common type of mesenteric cyst is a chylolymphatic cyst so mesenteric cyst can be of two types chylolymphatic and enterogenous and you should know that chylolymphatic cysts are the most common that's all you should know but very importantly what has been asked repeatedly is the tilox triad so in mesenteric cysts we are going to see the tilox triad tilox triad is a periumbilical lump which moves along perpendicular to the line of attachment of mesentery and there is a transverse band of resonance so it moves perpendicular to the line of attachment of mesentery there is a transverse band of resonance this is tilox triad the a 45 year old female comes to the opd with complaints of dysphagia and intermittent chest pain barium swallow is done and the image is shown what is the diagnosis like i told you the images of achalasia and corkscrew esophagus are very important this barium image shows corkscrew esophagus corkscrew esophagus we will see in diffuse esophageal spasm patient is going to come with chest pain and this chest pain can mimic myocardial infarction so you should know diffuse esophageal spasm can present as corkscrew esophagus these barriums are extremely important achalasia cardia you get the bird's beak appearance and in carcinoma you get rat tail appearance so this bird's beak appearance in achalasia which is a motility disorder is extremely important you can see that there is gradual tapering whereas in cancer there is abrupt narrowing so you should not go wrong in these two barium images i have already discussed gas under diaphragm this we have discussed repeatedly another very common question is that patient is treated for gastric cancer and now develops a nodule over the umbilicus what is the likely diagnosis so umbilical nodule in a patient with cancer this is known as sister mary joseph's nodule and all these atypical presentations have been asked in the exam so irish nodule is left axillary lymphadenopathy virchow's node has been asked many times virchow's node or left supraclavicular lymph node or troisier sign is seen in advanced gi cancers troisier sign so troisier's is left supraclavicular lymph node Trozeo syndrome is migratory thrombophlebitis which is seen with pancreatic cancer. Bloomer's shelf is metastasis into pouch of Douglas. Sister Mary Joseph's nodule is periumbilical metastasis and Krugenberg's tumor is bilateral ovarian metastasis which is seen in these patients. So this is what Sister Mary Joseph's nodule looks like periumbilical metastasis. Krugenberg's is bilateral ovarian metastasis which can be seen in gastric or breast cancer these are two more signs which can be seen in patients with advanced cancers lesser trilat is multiple seborrheic keratosis and trite palms are hyperkeratotic palms but most frequently in the in the fmg exam sister mary joseph's nodule krukenberg tumor and left supraclavicular lymph node has been asked 
what is the most commonly performed bariatric surgery procedure so the most commonly performed bariatric surgery procedure is laparoscopic sleeve gastrectomy right is laparoscopic sleeve gastrectomy you should know roux en y gastric bypass is the most acceptable bariatric surgery procedure now no longer the most commonly performed most commonly is sleeve gastrectomy and gastric banding is also a procedure the advantage of banding is that this is a reversible bariatric surgery procedure so banding is a reversible bariatric surgery procedure which of the following iv agents is not used to manage upper gi hemorrhage so propanolol iv propanolol is not used because if there is upper gi hemorrhage blood pressure is already low and in a low blood pressure if you give iv propanolol that can bring down the pressure further that can be detrimental oral propanolol is used as prophylaxis not iv propanolol these are certain tubes uh, which are used to control upper gi hemorrhage temporarily you have sengstake and blakemore minnesota and linton's tube in the fmg exam details of these tubes have not been asked you should know the pressure the hepatic venous pressure gradient 6 to 10 you will have preclinical sinusoidal portal hypertension more than 10 we call it clinically significant portal hypertension and more than 12 is when the varices start to rupture so these three values have been asked in the exam you should remember them bowel obstruction i told you is a very important topic many many times bowel obstruction investigations are asked elderly lady comes with non passage of feces and bilious vomiting x ray is shown what is the diagnosis so is this small bowel or large bowel this is small bowel i will just explain to you why this is small bowel obstruction similar question was asked next year they had shown the image and they had asked which loops are dilated so these are jejunal loops which are arranged in a step ladder pattern i will just explain this to you so that it becomes easier for you to answer so whenever we get a patient with bowel obstruction now what are the clinical features of bowel obstruction you can have vomiting obstipation distension and pain okay anyone who comes with this the first investigation which we do is x ray abdomen erect and supine we are going to do x ray abdomen erect and supine that is what we are going to carry out in these patients so once we've done an x ray abdomen erect and supine erect x ray you will see air fluid levels if there are more than 3 air fluid levels that is suggestive of obstruction the supine film tells us about the site jejunum will have a feathery appearance you can see that there are complete volvulae these are known as complete volvulae which are extending from one wall to the other and you will get a feathery appearance that is why in this question you can see we had marked jejunum because of the feathery appearance similarly you can see complete volvulae here as well that is why we are calling it small bowel obstruction large bowel is seen in the periphery of the x ray film and incomplete hostrations you can compare them with these volvulae volvulae were going from one wall to the other whereas hostrations do not traverse the entire wall so which of the following statements is not true regarding bowel obstruction so if we are going to operate a patient with bowel obstruction please remember i have told you initial investigation investigation of choice initial management of bowel obstruction is we make the patient nil per oral npo we are going to use iv fluids iv antibiotics painkillers put in a nasogastric tube now when we do surgery the first structure which we need to analyze is the cecum if the cecum is collapsed we call it small intestinal obstruction if the cecum is distended we call it large bowel obstruction so the first structure we are going to see is the cecum This was also asked in the FMG exam. Patient comes with low grade fever, anorexia, weight loss, barium meal follow through. This investigation is seen. This is classical of ileocecal tuberculosis. Many names for this: swan neck deformity. Right? You can see there is a pulled up ICJ. There is a pulled up ileocecal junction in these patients. This 
is seen in ileocecal tuberculosis. X-ray of the patient after abdominal surgery is shown. You can see distended bowel. So the patient is in a state of ileus. Now patient is in a state of ileus. The most common cause of ileus is hypokalemia. Hypokalemia can give rise to prolonged ileus. Very important, very, very important you should know for the exam. Performing an appendicectomy, surgeon encounters this lesion two feet proximal to the ileocecal junction. What is the diagnosis? This is Meckel's diverticulum. Asked almost every year in the FMG exam. Meckel's diverticulum, it is a remnant of the vitello-intestinal duct. It is a true diverticulum because all the layers are there and you get rule of two. 2% 2 population you see it in 2 inches long and it is situated 2 feet from the ileocecal junction. So Meckel's the most common presentation in children is bleeding and this bleeding occurs due to ectopic gastric mucosa. This was also asked in last to last year's FMG exam. We diagnose this using a technetium 99 per technate scan and it is a self-limiting condition. The most common presentation in adults is obstruction due to intersusception. That is the most common presentation in adults. Intersusception is when one bubble loop goes into the other. And in intersusception, you should know the radiological signs. You can get claw sign and you can get target sign as well. So intersusception, claw sign and target sign, you can see target sign on ultrasound. This is coffee bean appearance. This is coffee bean appearance which is seen in sigmoid volvulus. This has also been asked many times. This can also give rise to obstruction and you get this coffee bean sign or bent inner tube sign. In sigmoid volvulus you can also get bird's beak sign if you do a contrast study. A newborn comes with bilious vomiting. Remember, we did hypertrophic pyloric stenosis. There it was non-bilious vomiting. Here the child is coming with bilious vomiting. So the obstruction is distal to the second part of duodenum. And you can see double bubble sign. You can see two bubbles on an x-ray. This is duodenal atresia. And we need to carry out duodenal duodenostomy in these patients. This is jejunal atresia where you will get triple bubble signs. So jejunal atresia, we are going to see triple bubble sign in jejunal atresia. This question was asked last year in the FMG exam. They had asked you to identify the stoma in the right iliac fossa. So in the right iliac fossa, we can only bring out the ileum, right? Left iliac fossa, we can bring out the colon as well. But right iliac fossa, we can only bring out the ileum. So it is either a loop ileostomy or an end ileostomy and because we can see two openings, one and two, this is a loop ileostomy. In an end ileostomy, only one opening we would have seen. So you can see here end stoma, single opening, loop or double barrel stoma, you will see two openings. Complications of stoma, the most common complication is skin excoriation. But the most common long-term complication of colostomy is parastomal herniation. So you can see here, this image is loop ileostomy. I just showed you why is it loop ileostomy. Here you can see a single opening. So this is an end colostomy. Because one more reason of ileostomy versus colostomy is that ileostomy is raised above the surface. Ileostomy is raised above the surface, whereas a colostomy is always flush with the skin. It is at the same level as the skin. 45-year-old male comes with pain abdomen, vomiting and diarrhea. Serum serotonin value is raised. In the second test and discussion or second potential question video, I had told you about endocrine surgery and I told you every year they are either asking carcinoid or they are asking about pheochromocytoma. Here serotonin is raised, so this will go in favor of carcinoid tumor. Okay, So you should know about carcinoid and pheochromocytoma. Another very important question, 19 year old male came to the ER with the recurrent episodes of intersusception. 
On surgery, we can see a polyp. The histopathology of the polyp is shown below. You can see it as an arborizing pattern. It is like a tree. Arborizing pattern is there. Okay. Like a tree. So, this is a hematomatous polyp. And this syndrome has been asked many times. Pugh Jagger syndrome. Many, many times this has been asked in the FMG exam. This is because of LKB1 STK11 gene on chromosome 19. Jejunum is the most common site and you will see perioral melanosis in these patients. You are going to see perioral melanosis in these patients. A 36 year old male comes with passage of blood and mucus in the feces. Sigmoidoscopy you can see rectal inflammation on biopsy crypt abscesses are seen. So crypt abscess you should know that we are dealing with ulcerative colitis. In ulcerative colitis rectal involvement is more common. In Crohn's disease anal involvement is more common. Ulcerative colitis is continuous spread whereas Crohn's disease you will get skip lesions in Crohn's disease. Both are inflammatory bowel diseases. Patient is suffering from inflammatory bowel disease. Patient comes with peritonitis and perforation of the ileum. How should this patient be managed? So because the patient has come with peritonitis and perforation and there is inflammatory bowel disease, the best would be to carry out an ileostomy and to carry out definitive surgery later. 70 year old male comes with bleeding per rectum. There is a mass suspicious for cancer. What will you, what will you suggest? So, if we have a suspicious growth in the rectum and we want to confirm the diagnosis, what will we do? Sigmoidoscopy or colonoscopy? So, in these patients, we should carry out a colonoscopy because we should see the entire colon. Sometimes there can be multiple tumors. So, it's worthwhile seeing the entire colon. Three-day-old child comes with greenish-yellow discharge from the umbilicus. What is the most likely cause? So, greenish-yellow discharge from the umbilicus. This persistent umbilical end of vitello-intestinal duct. So, what is this vitello-intestinal duct? This vitello-intestinal duct joins the small bowel with the umbilicus. This is the vitello-intestinal duct. Now, normally this vitello-intestinal duct closes. If it is persistent, if it is persistent, then there will be fecal matter through the umbilicus. Right? If the intestinal end is persistent, then this we've discussed will become Meckel's diverticulum. And if the umbilical end is persistent, then the patient can come with greenish yellow discharge. So, these are the three things which can go wrong with a vitello-intestinal duct. What if they say that the child is coming with urine from the umbilicus? Then it is because of urecus, persistent urecus. Five-year-old child is brought with chronic constipation. Patient is taking stool softeners and patient is able to pass stools. There was delayed meconium. What should be done to confirm the diagnosis? So, chronic constipation delayed passage of meconium, we should suspect Hirschsprung's disease and Hirschsprung's disease, we should do barium, enema and manometry. That is what should be done. This is congenital megacolon and in these patients, the definitive diagnosis will be made using, definitive diagnosis is made using rectal biopsy. So, the next question is identify the condition based on the image. Like I said, this one question from perianal disorders is definitely asked. And you can see that there is an abscess here and there is pus discharge. So, if a perianal abscess forms and then it starts discharging, that becomes a perianal fistula. So, an, if you don't drain an abscess properly, it becomes a perianal fistula. I'll just show you the images of other perianal disorders which you should know about. This is rectal prolapse. This is pylonidal sinus, also known as Jeep driver's disease, where you can get multiple, ap multiple abscesses and sinuses, but they are in the natal cleft, not around the anus, but slightly above that. That is how you differentiate between a 
perianal fistula and pilonidal sinus. These are thrombose piles. This is a fissure with a skin tag and only in chronic anal fissures, chronic anal fissures will you see a skin tag. This is going to be painful whereas usually bleeding in hemorrhoids is painless. A male patient comes with itching in the perianal region and soakage of his undergarment with purulent discharge. You have to diagnose the condition. This is a perianal. Again, I told you perianal fistulae. You can see multiple openings here. This is perianal fistulae. The classification of perianal fistulae has been asked. This was asked last year only. It is the Parks classification. You should know the Parks classification is for perianal fistulae and the most common is intersphincteric type. Intersphincteric type is the most common. Recently, questions from rectal prolapse surgery are being frequently asked and they had shown an image and they had asked which surgery is being carried out. This is Thiersch wiring where we are doing a purse string, where we are taking a purse string suture. So, you should be aware of this image. Purse string suture is being taken. You don't need to know a lot of details. Just know that this is Thiersch wiring where we take a purse string suture. This is a perennial procedure for rectal prolapse. This is known as Delorme's procedure. And this is rectopexy. Rectopexy is an abdominal procedure. This was asked in non-FMG exams. So, just knowing these three procedures and the image is enough. It has not been asked in the FMG exam as yet. Very important are gallstones. Invariably, gallstone questions are asked. Like I said, ultrasound is the investigation of choice. And you can see a shadow here, post-acoustic shadow. So, we know we are dealing with, we know we are dealing with gallstones. Porcelain gallbladder is when there is calcification of the wall of the gallbladder. And this can increase the risk of cancer in these patients. A patient has findings of gallstone abutting the cystic duct with dilatation of the common hepatic duct. What is the most likely diagnosis? This you need to understand. This has been asked a couple of times. This is Mirazi's syndrome. This has been asked. This is Mirazi's syndrome. So in Mirazi's syndrome, what happens is that the gallbladder becomes adherent with the common bile duct. So gallbladder is adherent with the common bile duct. And because it is adherent, this stone pushes against the common bile duct. When the stone pushes against the common bile duct, the common hepatic duct becomes dilated. And finally, a fistula will form between the gallbladder and the common bile duct. This is known as Mirazi's syndrome. You should also know about Riglar's triad. Riglar's triad is seen in gallstone ileus. Gallstone ileus is when a gallstone causes bowel obstruction. This is secondary to a cholecystodiodinal fistula. So, the gallstone comes down from the gallbladder into the duodenum through a fistula. And the most common site of obstruction is the terminal ileum or the last 60 centimeters of ileum. You get Riglar's triad. Riglar's triad, you will get pneumobilia. That means air in the biliary tree. You will get small intestinal obstruction, which you can see here. And you are going to see a radio opaque shadow. We see a radio opaque shadow in right iliac fossa. So, these are the three things which we see in Riglar's triad. A patient underwent a lap cholecystectomy and in the post-operative period, he develops fever and tachycardia. Counts are raised and ultrasound shows a collection in the right hypochondrium. So, the surgery was done, gallbladder was removed from the right hypochondrium. Now, there is a collection there, means there is a leak. And if there is a leak, the first thing which we are going to do is we are going to put a pigtail catheter to drain the collection. Now, this is a very important slide. This slide will fetch you at least two questions in your exam. So, it's very important that you memorize this slide. The investigation of choice for gallstones is ultrasound. Gallstones is ultrasound, which I told you, post-acoustic shadowing. For CBD stones, it is MRCP. What is MRCP? MRCP is Magnetic Resonance Cholangiopancreaticography. So, it is a type of an MRI which is being done for biliary disorders, right? MRCP. 
For CBD microliths, this you don't need to remember for FMG is EUS, endoscopic ultrasound. The gold standard to detect CBD stones and to treat them is ERCP. This is ERCP. Now, in the FMG exam, they had also given an image of ERCP and they had asked you whether this is ERCP or MRCP. So, how do we differentiate the two? In ERCP, you will always see this endoscope in the image. You will always see the endoscope. MRCP, you are not seeing the endoscope. ERCP, you will always see the endoscope. And ERCP is both diagnostic and therapeutic. Whereas, MRCP is just diagnostic. So, small bile leakage of the cholecystectomy. Patient is stable. We will just monitor. Symptomatic patients with bile leak after cholecystectomy within 3 days we re-explore. After 3 days we are going to put in a pigtail. A patient comes with multiple gallstones, undergoes an ultrasound. CBD diameter is 12 mm. CBD is dilated. Serum bilirubin is raised. ALP is raised. What is the next step? Next step in this patient is going to be MRCP. I told you to pick up CBD stones, we will do MRCP in these patients. Which of the following is not a feature of pneumoperitoneum? So, pneumoperitoneum we create when we are doing laparoscopy. And laparoscopy, you will get raised intracranial pressure and not reduced intracranial pressure. So, whenever we do laparoscopy, 10 to 14 millimeters of mercury is the pressure. When pneumoperitoneum is created, you should know that sinus bradycardia. Initially, there is bradycardia. That is the most common arrhythmia. Please remember that. Initially, there is bradycardia due to vagal stimulation. There can also be hypotension in these patients. The diaphragm is pushed up, so the thoracic volumes are reduced. But the intracranial pressure is going to be increased in these patients. Very important which instrument is used for creating pneumoperitoneum. This has been asked umpteen number of times. This is the varies needle. All of you should know how to identify the varies needle. You have a stop valve here and you can see it has a beveled edge. So this is a varies needle used for creating pneumoperitoneum. This is again a varies needle for pneumoperitoneum. This is a sharp trocar which is used during laparoscopy. These are the laparoscopic instruments. This is robotic surgery which is the latest thing which is being done. And this is SILS that is single incision laparoscopic surgery. But from laparoscopic surgery the most important question is varies needle which you people should be able to identify. Last year's exam, they had asked an alcoholic patient comes with severe abdominal pain, pancreatitis is suspected and you have collection around the pancreas. Which enzyme is most likely to be elevated? So, we know initially lipase and amylase are going to be elevated. So, whenever we are suspecting pancreatitis, we will send out lipase and amylase. Identify the operation shown. Very, very important. Last two years... This question is definitely being asked that is Whipple surgery. So, Whipple surgery is pancreaticoduodenectomy and Whipple's is done for periampillary cancers. Rooftop or chevron incision is done and three anastomoses are there. Look carefully, three anastomoses. Gastrojejunostomy, cholidocojejunostomy means bile duct and jejunum and pancreaticojejunosmy. Three anastomoses are done in Whipple's procedure. The most common complication is anastomotic leak. Most commonly which leaks is the pancreaticojejunostomy. Now please again this image you should be able to identify for the exam. 25 year old alcoholic male comes with pain in the epigastrium radiating to the back. On examination there is a lump palpable in the epigastrium. So, I told you pain in the epigastrium radiating to the back, pancreatitis and you see a lump as well on CT. This is a pancreatic pseudocyst. The most common site for pancreatic pseudocyst is the lesser sac. 
so you should be able to identify this clinical stem and the ct this was also asked in the fmg exam you have to identify the condition you can see that the pancreas is wrapping around the duodenum this is annular pancreas annular pancreas forms when the ventral pancreatic bud fails to rotate right when ventral pancreatic bud fails to rotate annular pancreas is going to form there is going to be circular tissue around the second part of duodenum patient is going to come with projectile vomiting again double bubble sign will be seen we have already discussed congenital diaphragmatic hernia as i have told you boctalic is more common this was also asked in the fmg exam review the image and identify the condition you can see this is a para umbilical hernia right this is an incisional hernia this is epigastric hernia because it is coming out through the epigastrium how do we differentiate umbilical from para umbilical hernia umbilical hernia the umbilicus is everted right here you can see in this question the umbilicus is not everted here the umbilicus is everted okay umbilicus has come out this is para umbilical hernia where just one umbilicus is forming one of the boundaries of the hernia right so you look at this this image and this image are similar but that is why it is para umbilical hernia and not umbilical hernia and para umbilical hernia small opening so it can undergo strangulation a newborn is found to have herniation of bowel and liver through the umbilicus which is covered with a membrane so what is the diagnosis so there are two conditions in a newborn omphalocele and gastroschisis omphalocele is through the umbilicus covered by a membrane and liver can also herniate so you can see the child is born all this defect has come out through the umbilicus liver also you can see but it is covered by a membrane so the answer here is going to be omphalocele gastroschisis not covered by a membrane it is adjacent to the umbilicus that is gastroschisis so these are the abdominal wall defects which you should be aware of so the first question is that which cancer can develop in long standing venous ulcers you know that venous ulcers can be seen in patients with varicose veins and the options are basal cell carcinoma malignant melanoma squamous cell carcinoma and angiosarcoma so the correct answer here is squamous cell carcinoma and you know such an ulcer which develops in long standing venous ulcers is known as a margolin's ulcer so long standing venous ulcers and burn scars can undergo malignant change and the name margolin's ulcer has been asked multiple times in the exam so please remember this this margolin's ulcer is usually a squamous cell carcinoma and how do we identify a squamous cell carcinoma it is going to have raised everted margins the image of margolin's ulcer was asked in the last year's fmg exam so you should know the image as well it will be in the region of a scar there are usually one to two questions from skin cancer so i'll just briefly tell you about skin cancers as well the other one which has been asked in your exam is basal cell carcinoma this is also known as a rodent ulcer very important known as a rodent ulcer and it has pearly white margin right it has rolled out pearly white margin so squamous had raised everted cauliflower like margin basal cell carcinoma has rolled out pearly white edges and the important thing is why do we call it a rodent ulcer because it buries it burrows locally it invades locally right but lymphatic and distant spread is uncommon so this point has also been asked in the exam another point which has been asked the most common site for basal cell carcinoma is the face above the line joining the angle of the mouth to the ear lobule that above this line is the most common site where basal cell carcinoma can occur malignant melanoma there are certain one liners which have been asked you should remember these four one liners which have been asked in the exam the most common type is superficial spreading type the best prognosis is of lentigo maligna lentigo maligna is type of an in situ melanoma it does not invade worst prognosis is of nodular melanoma 
and the most common melanoma in dark skinned patients this has also been asked in your exam is acral melanoma so remember these four points in a melanoma another point which has been asked what are the changes which can be seen in a pre-existing mole which will tell me that that mole is getting converted into a malignant lesion so you can remember this as a b c d e this has been asked a is for asymmetry b is for irregular borders c is for change in color d is an increase in diameter of the lesion if it becomes more than six millimeters and e is if it is evolving change in size shape color so if you notice a b c d e changes in any pre-existing mole then that can be a pointer that it is getting converted into a malignancy so this is regarding the first question the next question which we have to discuss is which one of the following is not an indication for leprotomy you know leprotomy is opening up the abdomen in a patient with penetrating abdominal trauma now the key word which we have to remember here is penetrating you know there can be two types of abdominal traumas commonly blunt and penetrating they are talking about penetrating trauma so the options are presence of rebound tenderness bile leakage wound superficial to peritoneum and tag of momentum hanging out correct answer here is wound superficial to the peritoneum we don't do a leprotomy immediately in these patients look presence of rebound tenderness you know rebound tenderness is a sign of peritonitis so if there is peritonitis we definitely have to operate the patient bile leakage means that either the bowel has been injured or there's been some other biliary tree injury you have to explore the patient and omentum hanging out means the peritoneum has been breached. Only if the peritoneum has been breached, then only the omentum is going to come out. So if that happens, you have to explore the patient. So please remember, if you have a penetrating abdominal wound, just remember any wound superficial to the peritoneum, above the peritoneum, you can just suture the wound and send the patient for a CT for further evaluation. You know, CCT is contrast and CT scan. But if there is a peritoneal breach, that means the peritoneum has been breached. Okay. In that case, we have to do a leprotomy, especially if there's peritonitis, if the omentum is hanging out, or if there is bile staining of the dressing. The next question is a straightforward question asked multiple times the most common organ injured in penetrating abdominal trauma. So the correct answer here is liver. And you should remember these one liners. These one liners have been frequently asked in the exam. So another question is which is the most common organ injured in seat belt syndrome? This has also been asked in seat belt syndrome. The answer is mesentery of the bowel. So please remember these one-liners, they've been asked quite frequently in the exam. The most common organ injured in blunt abdominal trauma is spleen. Penetrating has changed and please remember this, penetrating liver is more common than small intestine. GSW is gunshot wound, gunshot wound to the abdomen. The most common organ injured is the small intestine. Seat belt syndrome has also been asked. Seat belt syndrome can occur if you're wearing a seat belt and suddenly the, the, you apply the brakes. So you will move forward. The seat belt will push you back. So the organs get compressed between the seat belt and the vertebra. That is seat belt syndrome. It is again the mesentery of the bowel. Deceleration injury is the DJ flexure, that is duodenojejunal flexure. And overall, the most common organ injured is spleen. Another question which has been asked, what is the most appropriate time to give antibiotics before surgery? This has been asked multiple times. And options are at the time of induction of anesthesia, 30 minutes to one hour before surgery, 
4 hours before surgery after skin incision the correct answer here is 30 minutes to 1 hour before surgery earlier the answer was induction of anesthesia but the latest guidelines say that 30 minutes to 1 hour before surgery is when the prophylactic antibiotic should be given so please remember these important points prevention of wound infection is commonly asked and it usually you have one question from this topic so you need to know that prophylactic antibiotics the best time is 30 minutes to one hour before surgery the repeat dose in case of prolonged surgery can be given after four hours this has not been asked in the fmg exam as yet but can be asked in the future the other methods to reduce wound infections the best method you know is hand hygiene is washing of hands and another question which has been asked in your exam when you have to remove hair from an operative site please remember no shaving shaving increases the wound infection rate these days we do clipping of hair using a hair clipper so no shaving clipping of hair should be done using a hair clipper another common question in your exam is regarding the ranula so they've asked the best treatment for a ranula options given were incision and drainage aspiration of the swelling excision of the submandibular gland and excision of the swelling plus the sublingual gland so the correct answer here is excision of the sublingual gland and the swelling so ranula you know is it is a mucus extravasation cyst please remember extravasation involving the sublingual salivary gland the image has also been asked in the exam, so you should remember the image. You can see that it presents as a cystic swelling in the floor of the mouth. And this cystic swelling is brilliantly transilluminant. They've also asked in your exam, what are the other brilliantly transilluminant swellings you know of? So the other brilliantly transilluminant swellings can be a lymphangioma or a cystic hygroma right you can also have epididymal cysts and sometimes hydrocele can also be uh, brilliantly transilluminant hydrocele's are transilluminant but brilliantly transilluminant are usually lymphangioma or cystic hygroma ranula and epididymal cysts the management of a ranula is excision of the sublingual salivary gland and the swelling Another treatment option for ranula, which has also been asked in the exam, is marsupialization. So this is another treatment option for ranulas. Marsupialization can also be done. Please remember, no incision and drainage for ranula. Otherwise, there is a high recurrence rate. This question has also been asked previously. The most common type of renal stone so the most common type of renal stone is calcium oxalate stone. Just briefly about renal stones. Calcium oxalate is the most common type of renal stone. And you know it is formed in acidic urine. It is radio-opaque. You know that 90% renal stones are radio-opaque. And calcium oxalate stones will have speculated margins. It has sharp margins, which is why it presents early. Another stone is struvite or staghorn stone. It is also known as triple phosphate stone. This has also been asked. And the question which has been asked that this triple phosphate or struvite or staghorn stone is seen in infected or alkaline urine and the organism responsible is proteus. This has been asked in your exam. Other types of stones, Cysteine stones are also radio-opaque and the question which has been asked, they are the hardest stones and you cannot break them by ESWL. The full form of ESWL has also been asked in your exam. It is a method to deal with renal stones. It is known as extracorporeal shock wave lithotripsy. So extracorporeal shock wave lithotripsy is ESWL. That is ESWL. You should know the full form. Extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy. Uric acid stones are the most common radiolucent stones. 
and they can be seen in gout and tumor lysis syndrome. Another question is, which is the investigation of choice to diagnose renal stones? Options are CECT, X-ray KUB, NCCT, that is non-contrast CT and ultrasound. So what do you think is the correct answer? The correct answer is non-contrast CT scan, NCCT. And you should know three areas where NCCT is the investigation of choice. So non-contrast CT scan is the investigation of choice for renal stones, salivary gland stones and head trauma. Renal stones and head trauma both have been asked in the exam, the investigation of choice. Please remember it is not contrast in CT scan, it is non-contrast CT scan, NCCT. The next question which you should know about, hydrocele in a child is best managed by. So congenital hydrocele, the treatment is herniotomy. Please remember this. The treatment for congenital hydrocele is herniotomy. This has been asked multiple times. So the most common type of hydrocele is known as vaginal hydrocele, right? And primary vaginal hydrocele is the most common type, primary vaginal. And the treatment for primary vaginal hydrocele, there are two procedures. You can either do Lord's plication. Or you can do eversion of sac or Jabolet's procedure. So this is for vaginal hydrocele and I've told you normal vaginal hydrocele, primary vaginal hydrocele is transilluminant. Congenital hydrocele on the other hand, congenital hydrocele is when the sac, when the sac is going to communicate with the peritoneal cavity. So there is, this is congenital hydrocele. In this you have a patent processus vaginalis. That means it is communicating with the peritoneal cavity and there is invariably a hernial sac present as well. So in these patients, we are going to carry out, in these patients we will carry out a herniotomy as treatment. This has been asked multiple times in the exam. Please remember this. Herniotomy is the treatment in these patients. The next question is that you have a 25 year old lady who is complaining of discharge from the breast, but it is from a single duct and it is bloody discharge. So they've asked the most appropriate treatment. Options are radical excision, microdochectomy, mastectomy, or a biopsy to rule out cancer. Right? So which condition are we talking about? You know the most common cause of bloody nipple discharge from a single duct is a duct papilloma. Is a duct papilloma. That is the most common cause of bloody nipple discharge from a single duct. So the treatment when you have a single duct involvement is microdochectomy. Microdochectomy you know is removal of a single duct and the lump. That is microdochectomy. So greenish nipple discharge can be from multiple ducts. It is seen in ductectasia. And because multiple ducts are involved, we will carry out Hadfield's procedure or cone excision of all the ducts. Right? So when multiple ducts are involved, that is usually in ductectasia, all the ducts are removed. That is known as Hadfield's procedure. But if a single duct is involved, Single duct bloody nipple discharge you will get in duct papilloma that is the most common cause and because 10% duct papillomas can be associated with DCIS you know what DCIS is DCIS is ductal carcinoma in C2 right non-invasive cancer so in this case we will do a microdochectomy that means removal of a single duct and the lump okay so that is what we carry out to to diagnose a ductal papilloma we do an ultrasound if an ultrasound is inconclusive we will do an MRI 
This was a question in last year's exam. The most common vein used for central vein catheterization. The answer here is internal jugular vein. Very important question can be asked again. You know central venous lines. The most common vein is internal jugular vein. Subclavian vein is commonly used when you have to give TPN for a long duration. TPN you know is total parenteral nutrition. When you are giving nutrition through the IV line, you, will, you can use the subclavian vein commonly. There is increased risk of pneumothorax when you are inserting a subclavian line, right? And great saphenous vein is not used for central venous catheterization, but it is used for venous cut down. Venous cut down or venesection is done in trauma patients. If you are unable to insert an IV line, there you can do a venous cut down and the great saphenous vein is the most common vein used there. So invariably there is one question from sutures in your exam and the question here is which one of the following is not an absorbable suture, right? Options are polyglactin, polypropylene, polydiaxone and catgut. So the answer here is polypropylene. Polypropylene you know is proline and proline is a non-absorbable suture. The others are all absorbable sutures. Polyglactin you know is known as vicryl and this vicryl it dissolves in 60 to 90 days. This has also been asked in your exam. Polydiaxone is PDS. It is also an absorbable suture, but this has double the absorption time as Vicryl, 180 days. And catgut and chromic catgut are also absorbable sutures. Another question which has been asked, catgut is derived from not the gut of cat, but it is derived from sheep gut. Right, so not cat gut. It is actually from sheep gut. So sutures can be absorbable or non-absorbable. Absorbable sutures can be further divided into natural and synthetic. I have just told you cat gut is derived from sheep gut from the submucosa. Synthetic absorbable sutures are monocryl, best for subcuticular suturing. Vicryl, I just told you, is polyglactin, dissolves in 60 to 90 days. This has also been asked. Non-absorbable sutures can also be natural and synthetic. Natural non-absorbable sutures, all of you are familiar with silk. Synthetic non-absorbable sutures, proline. Proline is polypropylene. Very important, proline. You should know the uses. It is used as the hernia mesh. The hernia mesh is made out of proline sutures. Also, it is used for vascular repair, to repair vas vessels. You use proline sutures and it is used to close the rectus sheath. This has also been asked in the exam. Right, so these are the uses of proline sutures. Ethylon or nylon is also a non-absorbable suture used for skin suturing. Now, invariably you have one or two instruments. The images are given and they ask you to identify them. This was asked last year. They had asked you to identify this instrument. And if you've ever been to the theater, you can easily identify this as a curved artery forceps. So you can see it is curved, right? So you can have curved or straight artery forceps. This one is curved and you can see that these are, there are these serrations which are present there. So serrations are present. You can either have a curved artery or a straight artery forceps. The name suggests that you can hold a bleeding vessel with this. Right. The other options, this one was an Ali's tissue forceps. This has also been asked. How do you identify Ali's tissue forceps? You will see these teeth at the tip, right? And because there are teeth there, it can cause trauma. So you will not use it in delicate structures. You will use it at you you will use it to hold tough structures like the sheath or the fascia. 
you will not hold delicate structures with Ali's forceps. This one is a Babcock forceps. You can see the difference from Ali's. There are no teeth here. It is the, there is some space between the two handles. So you can hold a tubular structure using Babcock forceps, right? Like the appendix or the fallopian tube can be used, can be held using a Babcock forceps. This is a sponge holder. So see the difference between Babcock's, you know, you, there is some space. It is slightly curved. This is a sponge holder and you, you hold a sponge using a sponge holder and then you clean the area. So you must have seen the surgeon before starting any case. They clean the area. They hold the sponge using this sponge holder. So all these instruments have been asked. You should remember these. Another question which has been asked frequently in your exam, what is the utility of the instrument shown in the image? So this instrument, you have to identify the utility options are to make an incision. No, we use a blade to make an incision, right? Split thickness skin grafting is the correct answer here. It is used for split thickness skin grafting. And this instrument is known as a Humby's knife. Asked many times in the exam, right? You know the difference between a graft and a flap. A graft is one which does not have its own blood supply. Flap has its own blood supply. Right? So you know that skin grafts can be of two types. You can either have split thickness skin grafts or full thickness skin grafts. Split thickness skin graft, as the name suggests, it is thin. It is also known as Thiersch graft. Full thickness is thick. It is known as Wolf's graft. Split thickness skin graft has epidermis and part of dermis. Very slight area of dermis can also be there. And the most common donor site is the thigh for a split thickness skin graft. Full thickness skin graft has epidermis and dermis. And please remember we can use the post auricular skin, but we never use the axilla for full thickness skin grafting. And to raise a split thickness skin graft, we use a Humby's knife. So the last question which I want to discuss in this module is regarding GCS. It is very, very important. Invariably, there is one question from Glasgow Coma Score in your exam. So the question here is that a 25 year old male meets with a road traffic accident and the ambulance brings the patient to the emergency room. His vitals are stable and he opens his eyes to painful stimulus. He is abusing the doctors and his limbs go into abnormal flexion on painful stimulus. So you need to memorize the GCS score. You know it has three components, eye opening, verbal response and motor response. And if you add them up here, the score turns out to be 8. How? So you can see that eye opening is to painful stimulus that is E2, right? He is abusing the doctors or abusing the nurses means inappropriate words. So common in head injury patients, common in patients who are under the influence of alcohol. So V3, inappropriate words and abnormal flexion. That is another three. This is abnormal flexion or decorticate rigidity. So the score here is 8. You know the minimum GCS score is 3 and the maximum GCS score is 15. So please remember the GCS score. So by discussing these 15 questions, I've told you a lot of points other than the questions itself. So please make a note of these points for your upcoming FMG exam. Best imaging, reporting and data systems. Right. I'll repeat again, breast imaging, reporting and data systems. This is a method to document any breast radiological scan, which is done. Okay. So we have to find out the false statement. Not true means we have to find out the false statement here. It is applicable to mammogram, ultrasound and MRI. This is true. All BIRADS for lumps need to undergo true cut biopsy. I'll just show you that BIRADS4 are suspicious lumps. 
and all suspicious lumps require a true cut biopsy to rule out cancer. This is also true. BIRAD's three lumps should be followed up with repeat imaging tests after three months. Right, so BIRAD's three is probably benign and we keep the patient under short term follow up. But the short term follow up is after six months and not three months. So this is a false statement. And BIRAD zero is incomplete test where you can't make out what is the actual problem there and there you need further imaging. So the correct answer here is C. For BIRADS 3, 6 monthly follow-up is required. This BIRADS table has been asked many, many times in the exam. So you should know about this. BIRADS 0 is incomplete. I just told you. So supposing somebody's had a mammogram and it comes out as BIRADS 0. Then you need to do additional tests like ultrasound or MRI in these patients. So that is what we do in BIRADS 0. BIRADS 1 is negative and there's no, nothing wrong there. You call the patient after one year. BIRADS 2 is benign. Again, you call the patient after one year. No biopsy. BIRADS 3 has been asked many times. Probably benign. Short term follow up after six months is recommended. All BIRADS 4 lesions which are suspicious require a true cut biopsy. Please remember not an FNAC. The investigation of choice for a breast lump is true cut or core needle biopsy. It is not FNAC. Please remember this. BIRADS 5 is highly suspicious of malignancy. Again, a true cut biopsy is required. The next question is which does not classify as a locally advanced breast cancer. So one question regarding staging is asked in almost every exam and breast cancer and oral cancer stagings have been asked the most number of times. So you should know them by heart. These two staging should be very clear. Right. So the correct answer here is tumor more than four centimeters. Locally advanced breast carcinoma by definition is any tumor which is T3 N1 M0. Right. Any T4, any N2, that is fixed or matted nodes, or any N3, that means infraclavicular or supraclavicular lymph nodes. So these comprise locally advanced breast cancer. You know that inflammatory breast cancer is T4D. So this is locally advanced. Chest wall involvement is T4A. This is also locally advanced and skin involvement is T4B, right? So you need to know this, that these are locally advanced. Tumor more than four centimeters is not locally advanced. So this is the TNM staging. The important things you should know that T1 is a tumor less than or equal to 2 centimeters. T2 is more than 2 but less than or equal to 5 centimeters. T3 is more than 5. T4A is to the chest wall. But what is the important thing which has been asked in the exam? That involvement of the pectoralis muscle is not chest wall involvement. Please don't make this mistake. A lot of students mark this wrongly in the exam. Involvement of the pectoralis muscles is not chest wall involvement. Doesn't make it T4. Please remember this. T4B is involvement of the skin and only three things classify as skin involvement. Orange peel appearance or podi orange, ulceration and satellite nodules. So three things. Orange peel appearance or podi orange, satellite nodules or ulceration. Retraction and dimpling are not signs of skin involvement. Please remember this. Retraction and dimpling, not signs of skin involvement. And T4D is inflammatory breast cancer. So this is the T staging. You should know this by heart. The next question is that a patient undergoes parotid surgery and after a few months, the patient starts complaining of sweating over the parotid region while eating food, right? So they're sweating over the parotid region while eating food. Which of the following statements is not true regarding this condition? 
So first of all, you need to know what is the condition which we are talking about. This is known as phrase syndrome. Asked many times in the exam, phrase syndrome or gustatory sweating. Right? That means when the patient eats food, there will be sweating over the region of the parotid. And we have to find out the false statement here. So auricular temporal nerve is implicated. This is true. Mostly involved are the parasympathetic fibers. This is also true. It can be prevented by proper dissection during surgery to avoid injury to the auricular temporal nerve. This is false. It is not because of injury to the auricular temporal nerve that this condition develops. In fact, if the auricular temporal nerve is injured, then this condition will not develop. So this develops because when we remove the superficial lobe, these nerve endings which are left, they grow up till the skin. They grow and they start supplying the skin. So whenever the patient eats food, these nerve endings will now stimulate the sweat glands over the skin and they'll be sweating there. Right, so the prevention of Frey syndrome, if you want to prevent Frey syndrome, we want to put something between the skin and these nerve endings. So if we put a muscle flap, like a digastric or a sternocleidal muscle flap to cover this, right, if I cover this bed with a digastric or a sternocleidomastoid flap, then Frey syndrome will not occur. Botox can be used in the management of this condition. This is true. So the correct answer here is C. This is important for the exam. Another question in last year's exam, and this was a very good question. How do we know about deep lobe involvement on clinical examination? So in parotid, you know, there is a superficial lobe and there is a deep lobe. If the deep lobe is enlarged, the tonsillar fossa on that side, if you ask the patient to open the mouth, the tonsillar fossa will be pushed medially if the deep lobe is involved. Of course, the confirmation is by radiology. The next question is, a few days following viral fever, a 50-year-old female presented with pain in the neck, fever, malaise and a firm enlargement of both the thyroid lobes. Thyroid antibodies were normal and serum T4 was high normal, most probable diagnosis. So here the clinch, the clincher here is, the thing which we can, with which you can clinch the diagnosis here is the viral fever, right? So by, after viral fever, swelling in the neck, that is a telltale sign of, that is a telltale sign of granulomatous thyroiditis, okay? Telltale sign of granulomatous thyroiditis, also known as subacute or viral thyroiditis. So, subacute dequervans or viral thyroiditis, this is also known as granulomatous thyroiditis, can occur after upper respiratory tract infection four to six weeks later. There can be a lymphocytic infiltrate, and that lymphocytic infiltrate can destroy the follicles, and the stored hormone is released. That is why T4 can be. T T3, T4 can be raised initially. After that, because the follicles are destroyed, there is hypothyroidism. But gradually over 2 to 3 months, the follicles regenerate on their own. So this is a self-limiting condition. It starts after a viral infection, but after 2 to 3 months, the patient is fine. Patient is going to have a painful neck swelling. That is the key and upper respiratory tract infection. These are the two keywords which you should look for. And the management is mainly symptomatic and you can put the patient on steroids if the symptoms are severe. You know that the most common thyroiditis is Hashimoto's, also known as lymphocytic thyroiditis. In Hashimoto's or lymphocytic thyroiditis, it is autoimmune, autoantibodies are there. And here there is prolonged hypothyroidism. Okay. In viral or dequer ones, it was self-limiting. Recovery was happening on its own. Here there is prolonged hypothyroidism in Hashimoto's. Okay. And you can find raised autoantibody levels. 
auto antibody levels will be raised in hashimotos so the next question is that a 45 year old female devil presents to the opd with a thyroid swelling for th of 3 months duration there is rapid increase in size of this thyroid swelling and patient gives a history of a similar thyroid swelling in her father fnac reveals a myeloid rich stroma this question has been asked many many times diagnosis so a myeloid rich stroma you know is a classical sign of medullary thyroid cancer so this is the slide which has also been asked and you know this pinkish material is amyloid so if you get amyloid on a thyroid fnac specimen it is medullary carcinoma thyroid and you know medullary carcinoma thyroid sporadic tumors are more common than familial and familial tumors this has also been asked familial tumors are seen in men 2 a syndrome what is men men is multiple endocrine neoplasia syndrome so men 2 syndrome is where you can see medullary thyroid cancer and the most aggressive medullary thyroid cancer is seen in men 2b this question has also been asked and medullary thyroid cancer can show both lymphatic and hematogenous spread this slide of papillary thyroid cancer has also been asked many many times in the exam and these bluish bodies samoma bodies at least 10 to 15 times this question has been asked these are foci of dystrophic calcification you know there are two types of calcifications dystrophic and metastatic these are dystrophic calcification bodies samoma bodies and they can be seen in papillary carcinoma thyroid you should also know the other tumors where they can be seen that is also been asked meningioma serous cyst adenocarcinoma of the ovary so i am repeating meningioma prolactinoma serous cyst adenocarcinoma of the ovary serous tumors of the pancreas and papillary thyroid cancer also papillary variant of renal cell carcinoma so these are the various places where samoma bodies can be seen also you can see orphan annii nuclei papillary thyroid cancer is the most common thyroid cancer also has the best prognosis most common and the best prognosis which of the following statements regarding venous ulcers are true except so we want to know the false statement regarding venous ulcers long standing venous ulcers can develop into marjolin's ulcer true this was asked last year marjolin's ulcers are squamous cell carcinomas in long standing venous ulcers ambulatory venous hypertension theory is the most acceptable theory correct all varicose ulcers should be treated with antibiotics this is false this is the wrong statement only infected venous ulcers need to be treated with antibiotics otherwise you don't give antibiotics neither oral nor topical and vac dressing you know vac dressing is negative pressure or vacuum or suction dressing can be used in non healing venous ulcers after debridement this is also true so the correct answer here is c this is a venous ulcer the most common site has been asked it is the gator area gator area or the medial malleolus the region of the medial malleolus is the most common site for a venous ulcer and the treatment is regarding the bisgards regime where we educate the patient we advise limb elevation elastic compression stockings dressings have to be done i am again repeating only infected patients require antibiotics otherwise you don't need to give antibiotics and surgery long standing venous ulcers this image was asked last year in the exam marjolin's ulcer can develop it is a squamous cell carcinoma in long standing venous ulcers or burn scars another very common question asked in the exam is most common mediastinal tumor and the correct answer here is thymoma this has been asked many times this is the most common mediastinal mass it is in the anterior mediastinum the most common mediastinal mass in children are neurogenic tumors which are seen in the posterior mediastinum 
right? This has also been asked, so you should know these two points regarding mediastinal tumors. Very, very important question for the exam is regarding IV lines. So you have a 32-year-old trauma patient after road traffic accident and the patient has a blood pressure of 80 systolic and pulse rate of 110. So of course there is hypotension and tachycardia. We need to give this patient fluids quickly. So which IV line are we going to use? So it is common sense that if I want to give fluids quickly, I need a wide bore, I need a thick IV line so that fluids can go quickly, not a narrow one. So which is the thickest one out of all of, the, all of these options? Gray. So you need to remember the color coding, orange is 14, that is the thickest or widest bore, gray is 16, green is 18, Pink is 20, blue is 22, yellow is 24. So the widest bore is 14 and the narrowest is 24, which is why 24 gauge cannulas are used in children where they are thin veins, narrow veins. But the flow rate is also less. Whereas with an orange or a grey cannula, because they are wide bore, the flow rate is very quick. Right? So when the patient is dehydrated, or you want to give fast fluids, use a wide bore cannula. Invariably, in every exam, there is a question from shock. So you have a 70 kg male who has come to the emergency following a stab injury to the abdomen. His pulse rate is 110 and his BP is 90 by 60. So again, tachycardia and hypotension is there. What percentage of blood volume has he lost? So, you know that hypotension will develop in class 3 shock. Class 3 hypovolemic shock is when you will have hypotension, systolic BP will fall. And I have told you that you can remember the, the percentage of blood volume lost like the scoring of a tennis game. So, class 1 is going to be 0 to 15 percent class 2 is 15 to 30 percent class 3 is 30 to 40 percent right and class 4 is more than 40 percent and I've just told you that hypotension is seen in class 3 shock so the correct answer here will be 30 to 40. So this is the table I've just uh, told you this is the table so class 1 is less than 15 class 2 is 15 to 30 Class 3 is 30 to 40 and class 4 is more than 40. Remember it like the scoring of a tennis game. Hypotension, systolic BP is going to fall for the first time in class 3 shock. And the other thing which you should know, tachycardia is the earliest feature of hypovolemia. Tachycardia is the earliest feature of hypovolemia. But systolic BP falls for the first time in class 3 shock. And in class 3, the patient will have hypotension. The patient will also be confused. And these patients, you need to give crystalloids and colloids both. You need to give fluids and you might also need blood products in class 3. Which is the most common vessel used for intra-arterial BP monitoring? So if you go to the ICU, intra-arterial BP monitoring is done in patients who are very critical and the radial artery is used most commonly. But before using the radial artery, there is one test which you need to do. That test is known as the Allen's test. Only after the Allen's test will you use the radial artery for intra-arterial BP monitoring. What does the Allen test tell us? Allen test tells us the patency of the radio ulnar communication, whether the radial and the ulnar arteries are communicating with each other or not. If they are not, then we don't use the radial artery, otherwise there can be compromised blood supply to a certain segment of the hand. Which is the most common vessel used for central 
continuous catheterization this was asked last year in the exam a very important question the correct answer is internal jugular vein so internal jugular vein is the most common vein used for central venous catheterization right subclavian vein has the highest risk of pneumothorax when we use for central venous catheterization femoral vein has the highest rate of infection or thrombosis and great saphenous vein is not used for central venous catheterization it is for venous cut down so internal jugular vein is the most common vein subclavian highest rate of pneumothorax femoral highest rate of infection or thrombosis and great saphenous vein is used for venous cut downs the next question is the most common cause of mortality following trauma so the most common cause of mortality following trauma is head injury this has been asked many times in the exam you can see here that there is a trimodal distribution of mortality following trauma the first spike is at the time of impact and mostly deaths are due to severe head injury unfortunately these patients are going to die at the site of injury you cannot save them but the next group the cause of death is within 1 hour right and the common causes are airway obstruction tracheobronchial injury open and tension pneumothorax circulatory arrest and cardiac tamponade and hemothorax so these injuries if the patient receives proper care within the first hour these injuries can be prevented which is why the first hour following trauma is known as the golden hour following trauma so proper attention during the golden hour can save lives and trauma patients this question has also been asked in the exam another very very important topic is glasgow coma score all of you should memorize the glasgow coma score for your upcoming exams so you have a 32 year old male who is brought to the emergency following a road traffic accident he is opening his eyes to painful stimulus and uttering inappropriate words on painful stimulus he is able to localize pain from the left side but his right hand goes into abnormal flexion what is his gcs score right so please remember here here we know that e painful stimulus is 2 okay inappropriate words inappropriate words is going to be v3 and the patient is able to localize pain and the other hand is going into abnormal flexion so the concept here which i want you to remember which has been asked that the highest motor response is to be considered so the correct answer is going to be e2 v3 m5 highest motor response is always considered okay so this is the gcs score you need to memorize this motor response m6 is obeying commands m5 is localizing m4 is withdrawal m3 is abnormal flexion abnormal flexion is also known as decorticate rigidity m2 is abnormal extension or decerebrate rigidity and m1 is no movement verbal response v5 is oriented normal speech v4 is confused v3 is inappropriate words when say the patient is abusing v2 is incomprehensible sounds the patient only mumbles no words come out and v1 is no response eye opening spontaneous is e4 to speech it is e3 to pressure or pain e2 and no eye opening is e1 you know the maximum gcs score is 15 and if the patient is intubated if you have an intubated patient then we write it as vt and vt is equal to 1 it is given a score of 
although the new GCS score will write it as VNT non testable right this is the latest one the latest update if the patient is intubated you will write it as VNT non testable but if VNT is not there in the options you can mark VT also and VT is given a score of 1 this is also a very important question you have a 20 year old boy following a road trip accident pulse rate is 100 per minute bp is 90 systolic right so tachycardia and hypotension his saturation is low and respiratory rate is high there is decreased breath sound on the right side and a hyper resonant note on percussion so hyper resonant note what does that mean does that mean that there is air or liquid inside Yes, air, because in liquid you are going to get a dull note on percussion. So this is the classical description of tension pneumothorax. Because there is altered hemodynamic status, that means there is tachycardia, hypotension and there is hyper-resonant note on that side. So tension pneumothorax is the correct answer. You can see in this x-ray, you can see tension pneumothorax. This is the side where pneumothorax is there and there is a mediastinal shift to the other side. So you will get a hyper resonant percussion note here. The emergency management is needle thoracocentesis asked many times. In adults, it is done in the fifth intercostal space in the mid axillary line. So this is an update. It is done in the fifth intercostal space in the mid axillary line in adults now. In children, it is done in the second intercostal space in the mid clavicular line. Right, children, second intercostal space, mid clavicular line, the old one only. And the definitive management is we have to put in a tube, a chest tube, tube thoracocentesis. And this is done in the triangle of safety. Right, so emergency management, needle decompression, followed by chest tube is the management of tension pneumothorax. You should know the new place in adults where it is inserted the needle. It is the fifth intercostal space mid axillary line. So these were some important questions for your upcoming exams. 